I am Stephen Foskett. I'll be moderating this panel. And you can find me on Twitter at sfoskett and on blog.foskitts.net. And uh, Len Rosenthal from uh, Load Dynamics. Steve Costigan from Sadara. Neil Storbart from Cloudian. Martin Glassborough, better known as Storage Board. Hans Linear, better known as at Hans Linear. <laughs> How did you come up with that one anyway? I mean, <laughs> I, I just can't imagine. Um, so you can hang, hang on to that, Len, uh, to start off. So I want to throw one out here. And um, you know, just to, to, to kick things off, uh, one of the folks on the panel has a very, very large uh, install of uh, storage and systems. Um, you know, without getting specific to your specific environment, Martin, um, how do you think very large companies here in the UK are approaching cloud? Do you think there's uh, that concern that I mentioned during my presentation, uh, during the q and I was going to say, probably very cautiously. Um, I know so we've looked at it. I'm not going to talk about the companies particularly. Um, I know other people have looked at it. I know there are cases where you would be surprised at the people who are actually running in a public cloud. There are some large financial institutions who are running stuff in a private cloud. But generally, we're, we're pretty cautious about it. And certainly with everything which has come out, um, Microsoft Save, uh, Office 365, uh, the issues that Ireland has um, with, well, with their data centers in Ireland, where they're saying, well, actually, if you, your data is in Ireland, oh, we don't care. We're still going to read it. We're still going to take it. Um, it's one of these things which seems to come up quite a lot. There's a lot of mixed opinions about how dangerous it is. Um, it depends where you are in Europe as well. Mm -hmm. So overall, would you say that they're still in the phase of fear, you know, cloud fear? Or would you say that they're, as I was trying to get at with my presentation, that the next step would be just sort of finding the right application for it? I think there's quite a lot of people already have the right application. There is just fear around what the states are up to, what the US government's up to. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a big problem for people in Europe now. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think Snowden's done um, a world of favor in many ways, but it may well have damaged the um, cloud industry in uh, the States. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you wanna... I, I actually do. Um, I gave a presentation a couple of weeks ago just about um, what's happening in storage, and I wanted to talk a little bit about public uh, cloud storage as such. and I. Um, I wanted to look at the numbers of the uptime of cloud storage because every, everyone is afraid, like, I'm, not, I'm no longer responsible for the uptime of my storage, someone else's, which is the biggest fear of all. And when I looked at the actual numbers of the uptime of, and let's say, the bigger cloud providers, right, uh, so not, not the local ones because they're not, they're not publicly known, they have a higher uptime than I had in any infrastructure that I ever worked at. I've been personally responsible for a 48 to 70 hour downtime because I did something wrong on the array, right? <laughs> I think everyone has a story like that. We do not have five, six, seven, nines in our own private cloud at home, but those public clouds, they do. There's a couple of them that have five and more nines. So that fear of uptime is pretty much a fad. Yeah, and I also want to point out, too, that, um, you know, and I'm not a sycophant defending my own government, but the U.S. is not the only government doing that. Um, and, and, and here in Europe, there have been a lot of stories about the government of France specifically doing very, very similar things to what the NSA was doing. And that does give pause to, um, you know, and again, I'm not trying, trying to throw rocks specifically at France. It's just that that's the one that I read about just the other day. Um, it's got to be a temptation, no matter who you are. Uh, you know, no matter which government you are, to want to, to see that data or to have visibility into that data. Steve, yep. I, yeah. I just uh, do we need the microphone here, Enrico? Oh, sorry. Chris. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. So just a question to follow up on, on what Hans said there and what you said in your presentation, Stephen, about eventual consistency. How do you measure uptime when you haven't got a measure of what consistency means. In, in the, the old world, everything would either be up or down because it would all be, always be consistent. Yeah, because it's, it's not black and white anymore. If it's eventually consistent, it's not black and white. How do you even measure uptime? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Oh. I've got a question. <laughs> I just want to answer that one. I, 
I don't think we have an answer for that one. Yeah, but I, but I love having the audience involved too, so go ahead, yeah. Um, my question was towards you, Martin, um, towards risk going towards public cloud. Um, do you think that companies will split their strategy, um, not put all their eggs in one basket in fear of Amazon may raise their costs at one point if they have so much revenue that they may, may reveal tomorrow? Do you think people will split this so they will eventually end up with two cloud providers? And then again, to the, the topic of the panel, that would be two silos of IT that they're managing. I don't necessarily think it's entirely a cost discussion. I think there are going to be some risk mitigation as well, where people will take uh, services from multiple cloud providers. Um, one of the things I think everybody's expecting to see, which really hasn't happened in any large scale yet, and that's cloud brokerage. So you're spot buying compute on whichever cloud you want to buy from. So the, the market will be driven down. I don't think there's a big risk of Amazon increasing their charges. I think we're going to see charges mm -hmm. consistently reduce. It's been interesting to see what people are saying about Amazon's margins. It'd be very interesting to see what's revealed. Yeah. But their margins sound like they're, they're pretty healthy. There's a yeah. lot, yeah. yeah. It sounds like there may be a lot of headroom in there. So, yeah, I think we'll see multiple providers, definitely. And I see, think we're going to see, it. we'll see a brokerage market at some point. It's a bit early, yeah. Like a compare the cloud. <laughs> yeah, compare the cloud.com. Yeah. Where do you want to run your uh, big compute? Yeah. Uh, one of the th oh, go ahead. Yeah. So, so I, I mean, the question is: is is the adoption of public cloud not driven by cost in the first place? Chris, you, you know, on your slides, you mentioned that was the number one, you know, I item on the agenda, and you know, as um, the CEOs and CFOs that ultimately make the purchasing decisions, they're going to be driven into public cloud because of the cost. And the big thing about Amazon is their, you know one cent per gig um, you know, tagline. And what, what we're hearing you know, from, from some of our customers and obviously what we talk about with our solutions, which I'll talk about later, um, is that the one gig, you know, one cent per gig is very interesting, but it's as the data is getting used, then the additional charges that are coming. And we've heard some horror stories around where the CFO is receiving bills from AWS, you know, where the data has, data has been uploaded into the cloud and suddenly getting access, getting, getting hammered, um, you know, and perhaps, you know, people not being aware of that additional sort of bandwidth um, cost and currents. But of course, there are other considerations as well as cost. I mean, obviously security, um, you know, performance, availability, all those things need to be considered. But I do think, you know, people are being driven into the, public cloud because of cost and because it's easy to consume. And also when you talk about bursting up services, well, that's a cost issue as well because it's cheaper to burst your service initially in the public cloud than go and buy a whole load more infrastructure. And then, you know, as um, I think it was you, Stephen, talking about, um, you know, as you get to a certain scale, then it makes um, a lot more sense to invest in, in private. And also, I think there's an important difference between storage and compute when it comes to bursting and so on, um, just because of the inertia, the gravity, if you will, of, of storage data. You know, um, One of the things that came up during Zadara's talk was a uh, discussion of encryption and uh, you know, basically in encrypting at the client. Um, w one aspect of that that I was hoping you can talk about is um, if you do that, if you encrypt data before it ever gets to the cloud, um, does that reduce the usefulness of additional cloud features? Because it becomes, you know, if you're talking about storage, it becomes just a dumb repository. It has no visibility into that data anymore. Um, essentially, it's just holding blocks. Does that decrease the value of cloud overall? And maybe does that increase the potential for multi-cloud solution because there's no differentiator between the products? I think the issue we see around that whole encryption thing is that you know, because of what's been happening in NSA, et cetera, people want to make sure that those drives are, are physically mm -hmm. encrypted, that if they're taken out, that they can't, that data can't be recovered. But what we see, certainly from our customers, is they want encryption right the way through. You know, so we, we've got a customer who said, you know, I want uh, SSL encryption to the web service. I then want encryption through to the storage. And then I want to ensure that what's stored on that data is encrypted at, at rest. So you know, we've enabled things like IPsec to um, 
the VPSAs and combine that with things like mutual chap, et cetera, to, to provide a boost over those issues that people have got around encryption. Um, but I think you've still got to take that up to the application level because if the application is compromised, it doesn't matter what you're encrypting underneath. So you, it, it's the, the same old onion, you know, that you've got to make sure that your encryption is at, at multi, multi levels. There's, there's another area that we're starting to see around that whole encryption thing, which is, you know, when you start to introduce things like wanting dedupe, you know, you can't do a global dedupe if you've got individual encryption keys because every bit of data is, is unique at that point. So there's, there's still some challenges ahead, I think, in, mm -hmm. in terms of the public cloud and trying to address all of that with integrating with, with applications as well. Yeah. While you're passing that, uh, everybody should Google uh, dedupe aware encryption. Uh, I think there is such a solution. Yeah. There is. A, there are some interesting impacts of encryption if you do it at the client as well on the cloud service providers mo model because some cloud service providers may be relying on dedupe to actually drive down their cost. If they can dedupe your objects, and if you, everybody starts encrypting things, life's going to get um, quite interesting for some of them because the cost model is no longer going to work for them. Absolutely. Yeah. But, but uh, from the, the perspective of, um, you know, in, in that situation where things are encrypted, uh, the, the question was, does that change the dynamics of the market because it, it removes the differentiation of various products? Yeah. And that's, I think, going to be an interesting outcome here. Yeah. I'd be interested in hearing the panel's thoughts on encryption in terms of how it's perceived by customers. Is it just a marketing fix? Because Clearly, there's a benefit to having encryption f for data in transit and encryption for data at rest to stop people sniffing the wire or pulling a hard drive. But at some point, the data is unencrypted and goes into a database or a web application or a RESTful API or something. And if anybody really wants to hack it, there's probably an easier vulnerability than trying to break the encryption, right? So. Is it, is it just a marketing fix or you know, is it just a perception thing to make people um, more comfortable with the cloud or does it actually have a real benefit? Okay. So, so I've worked across a number of different storage companies over my career and um, responded to many different RFPs, uh, which are always fun, um, so thanks for that. Um, and encryption, you know, encryption at rest gets brought up in every single RFP. Um, and, and I always look at it um, with a little bit of disdain, to be perfectly honest, because I, you know, I often think, well, the, the, the box that's least likely to be hacked is the storage array that's actually managing it blo in blocks. There's no intelligence in there. Even if you do get into it, how can you reconstruct the data? Um, and actually, the, the most likely um, attack is going to come in from at the server level, at the operating system level, and regardless of whether you've got encryption at rest, data at rest, you know, you're going to come, because the, the application's got to have um, the key to access the storage. Now, I see, I see data at rest really as being about, you know, if your disk drive fails, um, you know, and you need to take it out, and, you know, do you return that to the manufacturer, or can you take a hammer to it? Um, and obviously, you know, that, that helps in, in that respect. But actually, you know, people then start to talk about, you know, disk drives being stolen out the data center, and then I would suggest you've got a bigger problem if you don't have locks on your data center and, you know, you, you prevent that. But actually more interesting is now data going into the public cloud and, you know, Snowden revelations, NSA, and then, you know, what, what, what's been inferred is that the NSA is coming to the likes of Amazon and Google and saying, give us your encryption keys so that we can read that data and actually you know, if, if we can encrypt it before it goes into the cloud, then of course the control is with the customer and the NSA has to go to the customer to request the key. And even if you're enforced to give that, at least they're aware of what's being looked at. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's my, my take on it. All right, I saw one in the back here. Uh, yes. You strange man back there. Uh, it was just an observation <laughs> that you ought to get engaged in any cloud project with the world's second oldest profession we're the world's oldest profession, by the way, um, storage vendors. The, 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 the world's second oldest profession 
is the legal profession. You really need to get a lawyer involved in this because we're seeing cases where yeah. even things like storage of data encrypted where the keys are retained in the country of origin but the data is stored somewhere else is actually in breach of quite a lot of legislation. The law moves a lot more slowly than technology does and I would strongly recommend everybody, not anybody who's thinking of it, but everybody who's doing it, because that's the problem we've got, we're all doing it, to get a lawyer, get a good one. <laughs> Honestly, you'll regret not doing it. I, I agree on that, and I think that's where, you know, if, if you look at where we've gone, and, and, and certainly over this last 12, 18 months, our, our growth has come from in-country data centers where, you know, organizations are saying, you know what, this has got to remain in, in France, it's got to remain in Germany, it's got to remain in the UK, and you're right, the, the, the legal side of things is the biggest challenge that we face. And nearly every time we come across a, an RFP, et cetera, it's, can you guarantee that this data is going to be in this country, it's not going to be replicated to the US, et cetera. And it's, it's a minefield. You know, and for the cloud providers, you know, there's operational issues to, to maintain that you're complying with, with those regulations as well. So, you know, somewhere along the line, you know, somebody's got to take control. And that, that's the biggest challenge I think we face along those lines. So, uh, beyond security, um, I was, oh, I'm sorry, we have a, a question here. Is this related to security? Good. Um, <laughs> beyond security, moving beyond security, um, what, do we, what do we have, Julian? Go ahead. Well, I, I just want to, the, the panel discussion was about IT silos, and we've obviously covered a bit on storage silos, but um, what is the panel's thoughts on Amazon obviously being a runaway success with cloud, and we're probably going to find out tomorrow, and everyone's going to gasp and go, you're making how much money mm -hmm. and ripping us all off? Um, is the worry that Amazon becomes the IT silo, that Amazon and Azure being literally the two cloud providers that everybody has to use, is it a failing on OpenStack that OpenStack was meant to be an API possible clone of Amazon that everyone could use and would, uh, would open up the market to reduce these kind of silos? Um, but HP is creating their open, uh, OpenStack, IBM, everyone. HP can't even decide if they're in the public cloud or not or whether they compete with Amazon or not. So just to swing it back to on the compute side and different clouds and different silos, what are the challenges? Is that even a problem? Wants to take that one. Yep. So, firstly, it's a problem with OpenStack. OpenStack is fragmented, but if anybody can point to me a single OpenStack, what, you always have to ask what flavor OpenStack you, it is. It's, it's the world's worst standard, or heading that way. The only thing, only way it can get any worse is if they actually get a standards body actually involved. Yeah, then, I think SNEA could fix that right up. <laughs> yeah, any, any one of them could do. The actual idea of fragmentation of clouds, or but this is it's an interesting one. It's an operational problem more than a problem for developers and for compute. Basically, we, we are heading towards some kind of containerization or something like that. So as long as you can wrap your VM somehow, whatever it is, and you can run it somewhere, it's it's less of a it's less of a problem. Well, that's, that's what I think, anyway. So it's a port the fix is portability. So if you can run your VM slash container across multiple clouds and manage it, then who cares how fragmented the infrastructure OpenStack AWS is? Yeah, generally, is. generally that's, that's what I think. And I think um, I'll cover this later in my presentation. But it's making sure everything is um, as simple as possible. Um, if you start, I, I have a feeling, if you start drilling down into individual features of products, if you you find a snowflake feature, you say, actually, I like that, that's unique, and every vendor wants to sell you a snowflake feature, you probably find that you suddenly find yourself locked in. You are locked in somewhere. It's, you choose your level of lock-in. I think that you work out where you want your container to be. That's a great point. Is, is the question driven by your concern over lack of competition, so that, that it boils down to that you're going to have two or three choices in the market and nothing else? Partly because lack of competition increases prices, um, but there are so many different standards. An infrastructure layer, which we're talking about Amazon and parts of Azure, but uh, you know, is Cloud Foundry going to be the predominant layer, or is it just going to be containers on bare metal? 
you know, there are different things of competition. If we're saying that cloud can become a silo, but we can avoid it by using new technologies like a platform or, a, um, or containers, then does it matter? Because again, I think it gets driven down um, down to to the cost question. What what makes most economic sense? Is it to build your own? Is it to use you know cloud provider A, B, C? Ultimately, you see features and functions kind of propagate across different solutions. You know, we go back in the storage market, for example. You know, twenty years ago, when in fact you know let, let's use um, Alex. You know, give you some props here, but you know Net Net NetApps is um, you know snapshot capability. I mean, you know that was absolutely, you know, set the, the, the whole world on fire. You know, 20 years later, everyone's doing it. You know, some, some better than others, but, you know, so, so I think you see that the, the technology moves and, um, you know, organizations' requirements change and solutions and vendors have to kind of, you know, stay, stay, you know, stay along with that. So, you know, um, you know, there's been two or three storage vendors dominated the market for, you know, the last 20 years and, Okay, they're probably still dominating to to a degree, but there's so much more competition, um, so much new innovation um, that you know ultimately address the business issue, but in a slightly different technological way. So you know, VMware has really dominated the uh, you know the hypervisor market, and now we begin to see the you know that that change. You know, Hyper-V is becoming um, you know a viable alternative. KVM, you know, we talk about you know containers is changing their the technology again. So it, I just think it's an evolution. And right now, you know, AWS and Azure have a, you know, a, a grip in that space. But, um, you know, there'll, there'll be something new come along. So to your question of Amazon being completely locked in and, and versus the flexibility you would have with different platforms, I would dare to compare that to my phone. I, I have an iPhone and the iOS um, operating system is completely locked in. I can't do anything with it. However, the apps that are on there and the information that, has, that is within my apps, I can use that information and those apps cross-platform. I can't move the application to another platform, but the same application can live on another platform. And I think that comes a little bit to your question. It doesn't really matter that much which platform or what the underlying platform is as long as the applications can run on the different types of platform, or at least the information and what we want to do with it. Yeah, the separation of applications and data, that's an interesting, an interesting point as well. Um, does anyone want to comment on that in, in relevance to enterprise IT? You know, is, is enterprise IT going to get to the point where you have a separation between applications and data? I think, I think the key there is data mobility. You know, it's, it's one of the biggest challenges mm -hmm. that we face, which is I've gotten a piece of information, I want access to that. Where do I want it? Do I want it in Amazon? Mm -hmm. Do I want it in Azure? Do I want it in Google? You know, how am I going to access that from a common platform that's going to enable me to move it back on premise if I need to, into the cloud vendor A, into cloud vendor B? You know, what happens if that application changes? You know, so there's there's got to be some uniform way of gaining access. You know, if you're going to run in Cloud Vendor A's platform, you know, is there any dependencies between that data and that image? You know, so you've got to somehow try and abstract those you know, from a running platform. Maybe that's where the, the whole containerization you know, and some sort of standard there that's you know, at a higher level and completely abstracting from, from the data layer is, is really where we need to get to. But I think that's a, that's a challenge we've been trying to face and, and address for a long, long time. Okay, we got to disagree in the back. <laughs> drop the mic. Yep, drop the mic. <laughs> Do you have more to say? Sorry, I, I, yeah. I get really <laughs> passionate about certain things, and this is one of them. I strongly disagree that separation of data from the application is not taking place. What we're actually seeing is the reverse and the development of what I call crap applications, which are containerized and reduced applications. They're actually quite small, and they live in little sandboxes, and you can run them anywhere. They, in fact, look remarkably like the Internet of Things. They're addressable. And they may do something as simple, to give you an example. They may be an object that allows you to tell what your bank account balance is, and that's all the crap application does. It does nothing else. It just tells you what your balance is. These little applications are what people are going to build bigger applications out of. These crap applications are going to be very data-driven. They're going to be Internet of Things. They're going to be addressable uniquely, and there's going to be billions of the buggers. They're going to be all over the place. 
I agree, but you've still got to define an access layer to that information. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why? We already got it. In what way? Well, I can IP address just about anything in the universe at the moment. So, I mean, again, you've still got to provide an abstraction layer of, of saying this application is going to be able to access this information. How is it going to access it? What's, what's the format? You know, and from where, who, the security aspects around that. Well, I, I don't disagree with that, but I think we've already got all these pieces in place. That's the point I'm making. I think they're all there. It's just that we need to think differently about them, and the application and the data are not separating. And in fact, that's one of the problems I think that we face as an, an industry is that we have had discrete applications and the data has been separate. And that has actually caused us more pain and grief than we, than we really ought to have had. VM virtualizing things and containerizing things is a reaction to that. You're actually packaging together the application and to a large degree, a lot of its data as well. And I think that's gonna continue, I really do. I don't think it's a separation at all, which is why I'm disagreeing. I think there's a, I think there's a point well, here of. On that point, I think one of the one of the aspects that I was making before, when I th noticed things that I was talking about before, um, storage and, and compute are very different things because of the inertia of storage. And the theory would be that that, that if storage has you know mass and inertia, then it also has gravity, and it's going to pull, um, you know, it's going to pull the application toward it because it logically should. You know, the application being very distant from the, the storage doesn't make any sense from a performance perspective, as we heard this morning. So that means that it's, it makes it much more difficult to have any kind of cloud mobility. Do you guys agree to this uh, statement? Well, basically, you're just getting into the persistence problem. That storage is, data is persistent. So you, you're right. It's, it's at the moment, there's very little mobility between clouds, or you can move stuff between clouds. It's really expensive, and that's probably where, then, if anybody can actually break that, break that cost, mm -hmm. we'll see true cloud mobility. But until that happens, yeah, be, that is a big problem, Steve. Well, let me transition on to another point here I wanted, I wanted to bring up, is um, the extent to which um, standards are desirable versus not desirable. Should the industry develop cloud standards, or should the industry allow them to develop on their own? It will allow them to develop it on their own. I think, I, I just don't see a standards body be able to do this at the moment. I, um, I like to think, of it, especially when we start talking about containers, it's an interesting one, because if you look at the way containers change the world anyway, in uh, shipping, but nobody tells a tanker a manufacturer how to build their tankers, they just know they have to carry uh, a standard uh, TEU. Um, so, there are no real standards for the tank, but there's a standard for the container. But that just kind of developing, we've said that's a, that's a good idea. And I think that's what we potentially we will see. So you're saying that it's better to allow the industry to drive the standard, or to converge on a standard, instead of trying to set up a de jure standard, yeah. I think the, the question does not lie within the industry, but within the customer. Um, I've seen quite a lot of RFPs especially in public, where it is all about standards or it is all about open source because of the fact that they want to be able to, whenever, move between, uh, between suppliers. It is always better for a supplier to go beyond the standard. That's what we have always seen with, with Cisco, with um, Microsoft. They took a standard and, and extended on and extend. that, right? Yeah. Um, but I have seen quite a number of RFPs where they just say, well, these are the, the parts you will never be able to use in our environment, even though it went beyond, just because of the fact that you have to be able to change suppliers. 